science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is proudly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation.
science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is broadly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation. to our next keynote lecture which will be under the track of Tropical Architecture and Engineering which will be given by Professor Wong Nyuk Hin. Professor Wong Nyuk Hin is the Vice Dean of Research at the School of Design and Environment, National University of Singapore. He will give his keynote lecture on the development of a green and sustainable university campus in the tropics. Over to you, Professor Wong Nyuk Hin. A very good uh, afternoon uh, to all of you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, very meaningful uh, conference on tropical sciences. Uh, I would like to uh, share with you uh, this project that I'm currently working on uh, in terms of uh, developing a green and sustainable university campus in the tropics. Of course, this university campus uh, referred to National University of Singapore that I'm currently a professor and vice dean research uh, in the School of Design Environment. Next. Uh, this is what I'm going to cover uh, for the 25 minutes uh, given to me. Uh, I'll provide a very quick introduction about an S3 uh, NUS campus uh, initiative. The S3 stands for Smart, Safe and Sustainable. This is a program uh, set up by our NUS president about two years ago. Then I'll talk about the NUS digital twin, how we create that and primarily use it for microclimate simulation of the entire NUS campus. Then also talk a bit about the application. And lastly, I want to focus the talk also on 
developing a net zero uh, energy uh, building clusters in NUS. Next. Yep, so this is the uh, S3 uh, campus initiative uh, that was uh, set up by the NUS president, basically uh, trying to use uh, NUS as an urban living lab uh, to achieve these three uh, key objectives. Uh, smart, of course, here referred to spatial intelligence, uh, developing a very smart ecosystem to optimize space use and increase productivity. Safe, of course, you know, particularly in the current pandemic kind of situation where we want to develop a safe and wellness uh, workplace, focusing on safe and wellness for the workplace. And the next one is on sustainability. That is really the key focus of my talk on developing a sustainable and green campus, as well as on the Climate Change Action Plan 2030. Our president set up a very uh, ambitious goal to cool NUS campus by four degrees Celsius by 2030. So basically the talk is to talk, uh, is really to focus on that. Next. Yep, so on cool NUS, uh, the first key objective is really to reduce solar heat gain and also the heat load, right? So that through sustainable development and operation, uh, we are able to cool the en entire NUS uh, campus. So we make use of digital twin so that we can use it to monitor uh, in terms of sensing the whole NUS environment and also to use it for simulation. And of course, uh, we also aim to reduce our heat load uh, from our plant at Acorn, reduce consumptions by using a district cooling system, and also uh, try to use some uh, mitigation measures to reduce the overall uh, temperature of the campus, like using cool building envelope, using cool facade, uh, using spatial coatings, uh, introducing greenery, and so on. Next. Uh, this is a very interesting initiative by the president uh, in that <clears throat> we plan to plant uh, 10,000 trees per year over the next 10 years. A uh, very ambitious plan. And of course, the very important thing is really to understand what is the impact, the cooling impact of uh, such uh, trees planted. And that is also one key objective of this project. Uh, we try uh, biophilic design in terms of greening of buildings and uh, converting the hard core to be well shaded and also using more envir environmental friendly materials and so on. Next. Transportation is also very important. Uh, we focus on green transportation. Uh, so that they can drastically reduce the anthropogenic heat that is produced by the uh, transportation. <clears throat> Next. So this is an example of an NUS digital twin that we have created. As you can see, it's a very, very detailed model uh, that we have created using drone, uh, using uh, LiDAR. Uh, we not only capture the details of every individual building, but include the very complex terrain uh, for the entire NUS campus and also uh, the landscape, such as the uh, exact locations of the greeneries and so on. Next. So uh, we try to make use of this digital twin uh, to do uh, uh, microclimate uh, uh, simulations such as using CFD, uh, for understanding the wind, the temperature, and so on. So we model every uh, faculties, halls, resident, the surrounding building, and also we need to make sim uh, building uh, simplification so that uh, the CFD model can run successfully. We will capture the impact of greenery, terrain, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, NUS has a fairly complex terrain, so we had to use uh, satellite image, highly, highly, uh, a uh, sort of uh, high resolution uh, satellite image with one meter resolution in order to uh, achieve that. Next. So just go through very quickly some of the images to look at the uh, profile. So this is the domain size that you can see is fairly huge, covering not only the entire NUS campus, but including the surrounding uh, so that we understand uh, how is the wind field, for example, uh, around the entire area. Next. 
um, yeah, this is the detail of the model. So you can see not only captured the individual building, but also the detailed profile of the terrain. Uh, next. You can see a more zoom in. Uh, not only it shows the very detailed uh, profile of the terrain, for every individual building, we do not just model it as a solid block. Uh, we try to model as detailed as possible. A good example is all the necessary voids that is present in each individual building. We try to capture that so that the wind that is uh, simulated is realistic. Next. Yep, so this is just an example of the wind field that we have developed uh, using the CFD. Uh, we make use of uh, open form simulations for those who are familiar with uh, CFD. Next. Yeah, just another image showing the, see, the wind profile, the wind contour. Next. Yeah, this is an example of how you can see uh, how the terrain in this case interact with the wind. You know, uh, very often when we do the CFD modeling, we tend to model the building just on a flat terrain. But in actual fact, you know, when you have a highly complex terrain, it can impact the wind profile drastically. So that's why we need to capture that. Yeah. Next. Yeah, this is just another uh, result showing the wind view around the clusters of buildings. Next. Yeah, this is what I mentioned, you know, when we try to model an individual building, we try to capture the very essential feature of the building. For example, in this case, this is our central library in the university. And in this uh, library building, there's a huge void. And the students love to congregate there to have their social events, you know, students like to hang around and even uh, to study there and so on. So we want to understand the presence of the void, how it can enhance the natural ventilation in that area. So that's why our model must be detailed enough to capture that. Next. Uh, that is more on the uh, development and understanding of the wind field. Uh, to model the impact of the solar radiation heat sources is very challenging. And before we can do that, we need to understand the surface characteristics of the entire campus. For example, the percentage of glaze, the percentage of concrete, bricks, metal, clay tiles, and so on. Next. So not only doing that, you know, capture in the digital twin, uh, we need to also measure the surface characteristic. For example, the reflectivity, the emissivity uh, of the surfaces are very important. So we really need to, uh, you know, engage a large group of students, helpers to go around the entire campus to capture all this information. Next. Yeah, just a slide showing the measurement that's in progress, measuring the emissivity and reflectivity of the various surfaces. Next. So this is just a very quick uh, snapshot of the temperature profile. Um, currently, we are also doing transient simulation, understanding each time step, uh, what is the impact of the solar radiation uh, on the temperature built up over the entire NUS campus. Next. While we are doing this uh, uh, CFD modeling, which requires a very, very, uh, uh, a, a lot of resources required in not only in computational power and also manpower to develop the model, uh, we also are uh, making use of AI, artificial intelligence, uh, to develop something we call it a data-driven uh, prediction model uh, for temperature. Because over the years, we have been uh, gathering a lot of uh, sensing data for the entire uh, NUS campus and also for different parts of Singapore. So we then make use of AI such as machine learning and then develop a prediction model uh, that we can use it for predicting the temperature for any area that you are interested. For example, for a typical housing estate in Singapore, we are able to extract the relevant information, be it a level of detail 2, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and so on, depending on the requirement of the model. And then we can then use it to run the simulation. Next. 
So you can see the temperature prediction uh, over the entire area, taking into account all the various factors like greenery, the spacing between buildings, the surface characteristics of the building, uh, the, 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 the total uh, coverage area and so on. Yeah. So next. Yeah, so with that, we are able to also do this kind of mapping for the entire NUS campus. All right, so this is the temperature mapping. We call it the maximum air temperature mapping, which usually occur in the late afternoon between 4 to 6 p.m. So with this kind of mapping, we have a very good idea in terms of where are the hot spots. Next. Not only we need to understand the maximum temperature, we also need to understand the minimum air temperature, which usually occur in the middle of the night. Uh, sometimes we call it the nighttime urban heat island, right? This is the time where the radiation absorbed by all the building structures starts to radiate into the environment. And that's why we need to track that as well. So the minimum air temperature represents the temperature profile, usually around 1 to 3 a.m. And from here, you can see where are the hot spots. These are the spots that trap heats, and therefore there's heat built up in that area. So next. So with that, of course, we are able to work with NUS and tell them, right, uh, our, our facility uh, management uh, a unit or a un university campus infrastructure unit and identify where are the hotspots, right? During the daytime, these are the hotspots. Next. Uh, during the nighttime, these are the hotspots. Of course, the problematic areas are really those which are not only hot during the daytime, but also hot at night, especially, you know, in those residential area, uh, student halls, hostel, and so on, that it is very hot at night. So we really need to do something to cool the environment there. Next. So we also do a lot of validation uh, with the actual measured data, and you can see the R square has been very good, all, uh, all more than uh, 0.9. Next. Uh, we, we also develop a plugin uh, in SketchUp. So for those who are very familiar with SketchUp, you know, you just need to install this plugin and you can model using SketchUp for whatever area that you want to do. And then you can then use a plugin to do the temperature mapping. Uh, next. So sensing, yeah, besides doing the modeling, you know, develop the digital twin for modeling, we also need to gather uh, data, sensing data over the entire NUS campus. So currently we have actually more than 20 uh, weather stations set up over the entire NUS campus, try to cover the different urban characteristics. Next. Yep, so the, the data that we collected include temperature, humidity, solar radiation, wind, uh, rainfall, and so on. And it's powered by a solar panel. And also the data is transmitted on a per minute basis. 3, uh, through 3G, and then it can then collect it in a server that we can uh, understand the profile. Uh, in fact, very soon we are going to convert to 5G because the NUS campus is going to be 5G enabled. Next. So this is just the installation uh, on different locations. Next. Uh, next, please. Yeah. So uh, with the portal, you can go in and then you can click on any weather station so that you can understand the profile. Uh, next. Yeah, you can see the profile, right, in terms of all these parameters. And you can see it on a per minute basis, per hour basis, per day, per month, and so on. Next. Uh, we also develop a GIS uh, uh, and a Tableau uh, portal that allows you to visualize uh, for example, for the month of January, we want to understand the temperature profile, right? And that becomes very useful for us to compare that with our simulation result. Next. So we can display temperature, we can display wind. Next. Next one, please. Uh, we can also understand what is the thermal comfort. The OTCI here represents the outdoor thermal comfort index, right? So we can understand where are the most uncomfortable areas and what could be the reason for that. Next. Okay, this one I'll just go through quickly. This is another work done by a PhD student who just graduated. Basically, the idea is if you want to develop any new building, 
right? So that building or the, the new building or reference building, uh, whatever situation of that new building in terms of cooling load, thermal comfort can be affected by the immediate surrounding. So he developed this model that allows you to understand the interaction between that reference building with the surrounding. So that is really the key uh, motivation of his work here in doing that next. So for example, in this case, you have the reference building that could be a new building that you want to build in NUS campus. Then the model allows you to model the immediate surrounding so that you can understand the interaction between the immediate surrounding and the reference building. And it is a two-way thing. In other words, the immediate surrounding can impact the cooling load of that particular new building or reference building. Likewise, the, that particular building, for example, in terms of the facade characteristic, whether there's green walls, green roof, can also impact the immediate surrounding. So that is the key uh, objective of this work. Next. So yeah, this is an example where we look at the impact of the traffic surrounding this building and the impact on the cooling load. Yeah? With traffic, without traffic, what is the impact of the traffic on the cooling load? Uh, and so on. Next. So we also set up uh, uh, measurement towers and gather the data at different heights and so on. We call it the flux tower. And with that, we are able to use the data collected and use it to benchmark against the, uh, uh, the simulation results. Next. So this is just the actual physical setup huh, within the NUS campus to measure humidity, temperature, uh, surface temperature at different heights and so on. Next. So yeah, this is the one that I mentioned, uh, planting of the trees, uh, the campaign uh, set up by our NUS president, 10,000 trees uh, for the next 10 years. So next. Yeah, this is also a, 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 a work that we have done and published in Nature Reviews, Earth and Environment uh, since uh, last year, end of last year, uh, to look into greenery as mitigation and adaptation strategy to urban heat. All right, so we do a very, very thorough review in terms of what are the publication that's been done uh, in documenting greenery in cooling uh, the environment. And also we propose some kind of strategies in terms of greening uh, at city level, at neighborhood level, at street level, at site level, and so on. Uh, next. Uh, we also do a lot of measurements to understand the cooling effect of trees. All right, this is an experimental setup. Uh, because of time, uh, I won't uh, be able to go into the details. Because when we talk about cooling effect, uh, it is highly localized. So we need to really understand the behavior. Next. For example, our study shows that, right, uh, typically the presence of greenery may be able to reduce the temperature by 2 degrees Celsius. But the reduction in this case can be due to shading, can be due to required evapor transpiration, means the loosing of the moisture. Our result shows that actually it is the shading that results in more reduction in the temperature rather than uh, the losing of moisture, so-called evapor transpiration. Uh, this is primarily because of the very harsh condition we have, the very hot and humid condition that actually reduces the potential of evapor transpiration. Next. So with that, we are able to then develop uh, a beam model for greenery, all right? So this is an ongoing research work that we developed the beam model for greenery. Not only we captured the, uh, the geometry, though we need to simplify that, but we built in all the necessary attributes in the model so that it can be used uh, and integrate with the beam model for building in a seamless manner so that we can use it for not only uh, visualization, but also for simulation. Next. Yeah, these are just, uh, you can scroll through very quickly the next few slides, looking at the way we model the greenery uh, for the entire campus. Yes, just uh, scroll through the few slides. Yeah, so you can see that that's the vegetation that we are modeling. Uh, of course, this is another very interesting project to understand the impact of the solar panel, a microclimate. All right. 
So because we know solar panel use only about 20% of the energy, uh, solar energy for electricity, the rest is basically heat. So there's concern that whether there could be uh, heating of the microclimate uh, because of the large scale deployment of solar panel. Next. So uh, these are also other works, uh, testing out of the cool materials, uh, district cooling system and impact of the climate change as well uh, on thermal comfort and what are the adaptation solutions. Next. Okay, I have very limited time, so I may have to go through this part very quickly. And the other, so what I've shared with you in terms of the first part is really to look at the, at a large scale, looking at the entire NUS campus, the microclimate. All right, and what are the things that we can do to cool the environment? And there's a serious implication on energy as well, right? Because the higher the ambient temperature, the higher is going to be our cooling energy consumption. The other thing that we have done in our school school design environment is to develop, we call it net zero building clusters. So of course, being in SDE, we focus on these four buildings that we are currently working on. Uh, of in, in fact, for SDE4, it has been completed a number of years, which I'm going to spend more time talking about this. Currently, SDE1 and 3 is undergo major retrofitting, and we want to make it net zero as well. SDE2 is led to be demolished and rebuilt, and not only we want to make it net zero, but towards neutral, carbon neutral as well. Yeah, next. Yep, so this is why I mentioned SDE4 being the very first new zero energy building in uh, Singapore. Though our BCA has a zero energy building, but there's a retrofitted one. And SDE1 and 3 is for retrofitted buildings. Next. Uh, next one, please. Yep, so I'll, I'll spend just a few minutes. I have only about two minutes or so. I'll go through this part very quickly to just show you huh, some key feature of this SDE net zero energy building. Next. Uh, since completion, huh, this building has received uh, numerous awards. Uh, one of them is the ASEAN uh, Energy Awards in 2020. Huh. So this is uh, one. Uh, next. So the vision is not only to create a net zero energy building, but make sure it is comfortable building. It is high performance building. That is the most important aspect. Next. So we focus on wellness. Uh, please next. Next, uh, educational volume, living lab, you know, and also community. Next, yeah. So you can see these are the key objective. Next one. So that zero, of course, you understand the concept. Uh, I guess we can skip uh, this slide. Sorry about the time. <laughs> uh, this one, I think we can skip also because net zero means, you know, the energy that you produce. Yeah, this is really something that uh, uh, we uh, want to uh, focus on. As you know, in the tropics here, cooling really is the energy gas law, right? So in this project, we work towards something called adaptive comfort approach that we up the operative temperature from 24 to 29 and by doing that we also increase the airspeed but to be able to achieve comfort so that is called hybrid cooling next so this is really the total approach you know we cut down the full egg on and use hybrid ventilation uh, we use uh, photovoltaics to produce the renewable energy. We enhance natural ventilation. 46% of it is very much using natural ventilation. Next. So, of course, we have to work through step by step huh, with the design team from a reference building, which is 1,900 uh, megawatt hour per year, all the way down to less than 500, right? Looking at the envelope, looking at the aircon uh, system using hybrid ventilation and so on. So we are very proud to say that we are able to achieve net zero through this step-by-step -step design. Next. Yeah, we also uh, focus very much on wellness, uh, looking at the various aspects of wellness, right? Next. 
So uh, this building is one of the very first well-certified building. So of course, wellness, there's a lot of uh, focus on not only air, water, nourishment, for example. Uh, by setting up a canteen or a, a restaurant, a small restaurant in SDE4, uh, we make sure we are selling healthy food. So you can imagine we go all the way out uh, to ensure that we can fulfill the well-building uh, standard. Next. Yeah, we enhance a lot of wellness aspect by encouraging the student and staff to do a lot of movement. For example, when you visit this building, you will see that the leaf uh, cannot be seen at all. It is hidden at one corner because we want to encourage the student and staff to use extensively the staircase right, to enhance their movement and therefore their wellness. We use natural light and enhance the indoor environmental quality. Next. Uh, we focus a lot on tropical architecture. This is very important uh, to enhance cross ventilation, to use very, very large overhang, you know, that could provide good shade. And at the same time, of course, by having the roof to serve as a large overhang, it also provides sufficient area for the housing of the solar panel. Next. Uh, yes, this is just uh, some picture showing uh, how we. Uh, use envelope and landscape design uh, and enhance on tropical architecture. Next. Yeah, hybrid cooling. I think this is something that I mentioned briefly. I think we can just uh, move through the slides. Yeah, uh, can you click on the video? Just a quick sharing of that. So we do a very detailed transient CFD modeling to understand the interaction between the fan and also the air conditioning so that we can optimize cooling. Yeah, next. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so same thing, huh? we use a new numerical thermal mannequin to understand uh, how this hybrid cooling can impact the uh, thermal comfort. Yeah, next. Uh, next, please. Yeah, we, we carry very extensive survey to understand the thermal comfort because when we first introduced this hybrid cooling, we we're quite concerned whether students, staff, they can get used to this hybrid cooling. But we are very, very encouraged when we look at the results that more than 80, uh, if not 88% of them find it very comfortable or acceptable. Next. Yeah, this uh, net zero, of course, in Singapore, huh? solar energy is still really the pretty much the source of renewable energy. So we make use of about 1,225 uh, solar panel to generate the electricity. Okay, next. Yeah, so not only, of course, in terms of renewable energy, huh? the important thing is to ensure that the whole building is designed based on the envelope design, hybrid cooling, use of energy efficient fixtures, and so on. So as to achieve a net zero. Next one. Biophilic design is also something which I briefly mentioned. When you visit this building, you'll see a lot of greenery uh, being incorporated. Next. Yeah, just some photos showing the biophilic design. Next one. Okay, yeah, this is, I think, the very last slide to uh, show you that, right? Uh, the data show from January 19, uh, 2019 all the way to uh, March uh, this year, you can see that it has been achieving uh, net positive all the while. Yeah, so with that, you know, uh, it shows very clearly that this is a net zero uh, energy building. Uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Professor Wong Nyuk Hin, for that keynote lecture. We will now move on to the next session for the day, which is the Meet the Speaker session with Professor Wong Nyuk Hin. The session will be moderated by Professor Dr. Dr. Kamar Zaman Sopian, a Fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. For your information, this session will be organised via Zoom, and each of you would have received a Zoom link for that session. I will see you there.